Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our housing element event. Uh, my name is Emily, and I'm with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership housing team. And today, we are going to be discussing exactly why housing elements are so important to the growth and um, ultimate well being of our local communities. So, thank you so much for being here, um, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Um, so this is actually an event that's part of um, the celebration for Affordable Housing Month, uh, which has been kindly hosted by Housing Santa Cruz County. Um, and there have been some really wonderful presentations by housing leaders across the county and the region. So be sure to head over to their website to view the full event schedule um, and see what's in store for the rest of the month. And we'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat. Um, we just want to give a big thank you um, to Nui Homes and Yimbi La, who have played a major role um, in developing the content for these events. And as many of you know or will know very soon, um, housing elements um, are not an easy subject to present on. Uh, so we thank them so very much for their support um, and involvement in these events. And uh, we look forward to working with you going forward. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with our work here at Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, um, our housing initiative launched in 2016 to support an increase in the supply of housing at all income levels in the Monterey Bay region. And so we do this in partnership with a broad uh, regional coalition of individuals and organizations um, from a variety of sectors, um, some of whom are here today. Um, and we all share the common goal of improving the economic health and overall quality of life in the region. And our housing initiative um, would not be possible without uh, the Monterey Peninsula Foundation and the Community Foundation uh, for Monterey County. So thank you so much for your continued dedication to this issue um, and your support of our initiative. So some of you might have tuned into our housing element uh, kickoff event, which we hosted back in March. And we had a really amazing turnout of folks from across the region, uh, from lifelong housers to elected officials to first time advocates um, and everyone in between. Um, so thank you to all who attended um, and to those who signed up to stay in the know on all things housing elements in the Monterey Bay region. Um, so we want to welcome you all to sign up as well. Um, and here is uh, the link, we'll also put it in the chat. Um, we just want to get a sense of who you are and what your priorities are going into the housing element update process. Um, and if you would, please also um, tell us who you are in the chat. Um, just give us your name, um, where you're coming from, which organization you're with, and also um, where you are a resident. Um, and so we will uh, be monitoring uh, the chat and interacting with you throughout uh, the presentation. So uh, feel free to continue chatting with us. And if you have any questions um, during the presentation, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will either answer them live or during the final Q&A portion of the event. Um, so for those of you who are not able to make it to our housing element kickoff event, you're in luck because I'm about to give you a crash course on all of these uh, materials just so we're on the same page about how we got to where we are today um, and the role that housing elements play in uh, remediating some of these issues. So if you want to dig in further, please be sure to go back uh, and check out the full event recap, uh, which we will We'll also link in the chat. Um, great, so what is a housing element? Um, and no, I'm not talking about wood or concrete or metal. I'm talking about a public planning document that is produced by cities and counties across California every eight years. Um, and this document really serves as our housing blueprint um, and gives us an opportunity uh, to identify opportunities. So that could come in the form of opportunity zones um, or innovative financing programs. It gives us the chance to outline our priorities, who needs housing and where, um, to set goals, how much and in what period of time. And finally, this is a chance to really um, codify our values as a community. Um, so why go through this every eight years? And um, how did we get into such 
a housing mess in the state of California. When we think about the state housing crisis um, that we experience in a very real way here on the local level, it is important to acknowledge that it really is rooted in a history of racism that was carried out not only um, by private society, but also all three levels of government through racialized housing policies and exclusionary actions. Um, so when we think about historically racist housing policies, there are really two things that come to mind. The first is redlining, which refers to a practice that began as part of uh, the New Deal in the 1930s, when the federal government began issuing home ownership loans to Americans through the newly formed Home Ownership Loans Corporation, or the HOLC. Um, and this organization um, really uh, started redlining when they issued color-coded maps to guide investment and rated a neighborhood's investment risk based on race and ethnicity. So neighborhoods that were home to Black, Latino, or immigrant communities were deemed as risky and actively denied federal investment while white neighborhoods benefited from this investment and were able to plant the seeds and continue to build generational wealth. Um, and redlining also you know, enforced segregation that was already there and was implemented across the country and not just in California. But this map in particular shows an example of redlining in San Jose. Um, a second example of a racialized housing policy is exclusionary zoning. Uh, so prior to the 1968 Fair Housing Act, it wasn't uncommon uh, for homes to have racial covenants, um, which explicitly barred Black, Indigenous, people of color from purchasing or renting these homes and entering white neighborhoods. Um, so a less explicit form of exclusionary zoning is single family zoning, uh, which is obviously still pervasive today. It makes up the vast majority of zoned areas. Um, across the state. Um, so many of these practices I've mentioned um, have largely been done away with, but the lasting impacts are very real and they are, um, they continue to be felt by our communities uh, in Santa Cruz County, in the Monterey Bay region and across the state of California. So some of these impacts um, include systematic disinvestment, the prioritization of construction of single family homes in wealthier areas uh, with better job opportunities, um, stigma against affordable housing development, and uh, the perpetuation of outdated planning practices. So this ultimately all leads to increased housing and unaffor unaffordability, which doesn't benefit anybody. Um, so what do we do now? Well, the, the housing element, uh, which is why we're here, is a really important uh, component of addressing these historic harms. So why a housing element um, in each city and county in California is required by law um, and must do the following things. It has to address anti-displacement, uh, inclusion. It has to identify local funding sources. Um, it has to um, identify site and building regulations um, and, and outline state requirements. It also needs to demonstrate how each jurisdiction will work to accommodate regional needs allocation. Um, and again, please review our uh, prior event for a more in-depth um, explanation on, on this process. It's quite complicated and um, lengthy. Um, but we have a lot of good information um, in that event recap. Um, also, a housing element must provide a regional and municipal tools for streamline, streamlining approval processes. That's a really big one. And it also must be clearly formatted and accessible to the public so that it's not a document that just sits on a shelf and it's actively being used um, in these communities for the duration of the, the eight years that it's in place for. Um, so now that you can see why it's so important that we're on the same page about how we want to plan for the ne next eight years of growth in our region, um, we want to um, also uh, point to our housing white paper, which was written in partnership with um, Sibley Simon of New Way Homes, who is here with us today, um, and outlines nine key policy recommendations that local governments can adopt to help us reach these housing goals. Um, which we can also link to in the chat. 
Um, so many of these principles that, that we've written about can and should be crystallized within a jurisdiction's housing element. Um, and the implementation of these recommendations can lead to housing elements that explicitly prioritize, enable, and incentivize um, housing that is affordable, dense, inclusive, transit-oriented, and that benefits um, the members of our community, our economy, and also um, help us to meet our, our climate and sustainability goals. Um, we also want to make sure that our policies and practices that are outlined in housing elements um, are fully compliant with state law. Um, and of course, uh, some of you might know that this has changed quite a bit over the last eight years, um, and we'll get into that uh, during the panel discussion a little bit. And we'd also um, like to note that this is a process that, like the element itself, should be inclusive of all community members. So we're really hoping that cities and counties um, provide space for robust and regular community conversations around what we'd like to see in our respective communities. Okay, so that was a lot of information I just threw at you in um, in 10 minutes. So um, again, if you would like to learn more, please review our housing element kickoff event. Um, we went into much greater detail on these issues and the RENA allocation process. Um, so if you are interested, please look at that link. And if you'd like to stay in the loop, please again, be sure to sign up. Um, sign in rather, and then um, subscribe to our action center so that we can send you alerts when there are opportunities for engagement. Um, I also want to encourage you to sign up with Yimby Law to be a housing element watchdog. Um, their campaign for fair housing elements uh, connects housing leaders statewide and helps local advocates coordinate their efforts around housing element updates. So we'll share all these links again later in the program, but these are some initial opportunities to, to get you started. So um, without further ado, I would like to pass things over to our housing program manager, uh, Matt Huerta, who is here to facilitate our panel discussion. And we have a great lineup today. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Matt, and um, enjoy. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm not sure if folks can see me just yet. Uh, there we go. But um, good morning, everybody. And thank you again, Emily, for the excellent crash course. Uh, you remind me just how important uh, and personal really this work is and uh, how it, it's important to get it right, not only for the next eight years, but this uh, work is really going to set the stage for the next 20 to 30 years and um, give us a chance to not only address, again, uh, the historical um, impacts from, from uh, generations of, of exclusionary practices, but moving forward, you know, how do we, uh, you know, honor, um, you know, equity and uh, a new way of, of doing business in our community uh, in terms of housing. Um, so thank you for that. It's an honor to uh, moderate today's panel discussion with some of our region's housing leaders. And I'm going to ask our panelists to join me on camera uh, as soon as I call their names and titles. And I'm gonna start with uh, Sibley Simon, uh, president of New Way Homes. Please join me. Thanks, Matt. Did you want me to introduce myself a little better? I'll give you, uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, I'm just gonna okay. ask you. Yeah, yeah, great, Thank you. just waving. I want to make sure it works first. All right. And then uh, we also have Catherine Donovan, senior planner at the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, and everybody. Perfect. Ashley Gower, program manager for special projects, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Hi, Ash. And Jan Linenthal, vice president of real estate development for MidPen. Morning. Perfect. So again, thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, I hope you and your loved ones are well. We'll begin with a, a set of the same questions that each of you can answer within two minutes. And then uh, we'll get into some specifics about your particular experiences. And we'll end with questions from the audience. Um, participants, uh, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions and we'll field them as best as we can. Uh, so let's just dig right in. Um, 
first question to everybody, and I'll call uh, in individuals as, as we go through. But the first question is, what is your organization's role in the housing element update process? And how is your organization impacted uh, by the housing uh, element update? And maybe just give a, a quick uh, line or two about uh, your, your ex personal experience. And we'll start with Sibley. All right, I uh, work with uh, New Way Homes and Envision Housing, and we work to try to build more affordable and workforce housing, uh, especially in the Monterey Bay region to alleviate this housing uh, shortage and, and affordability crisis we have. And we find that the, uh, the biggest barrier is that most housing is not legal to build in most places. And so, you know, we find places, we find capital um, and uh, places with, you know, infill close to jobs and transit, and um, it's just not legal. So the housing element is a great way um, to cause change to those local uh, prohibitions. And so I'm just excited as an advocate, but who has, wants to see workable rules that we can really use um, to, you know, help and help organize and work with MBEP um, to organize, uh, you know, we see, and I just the last thing I'll say, you know, we see with housing developments and stuff, you know, there are a lot of controversy around any one development, but um, the housing element's been a pretty quiet process in the past. So if we can be pro housing advocates, uh, then I think we can have influence to help these uh, changes be um, really have positive impact in the years to come. Thank you, Sibley. Yeah, pro housing, uh, I'll underline that one. And uh, next we wanna hear from Catherine, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Donovan. I'm a senior planner in our uh, advanced planning division for the city of Santa Cruz. So the housing element actually is a document, a, a policy document that is adopted by the city and approved by the state. So our role in it is actually to produce this document. Um, and we do that by um, re, uh, both meeting the requirements of the state for housing elements and reaching out to the public to get um, input into the, the, the specific policy range that we want to see in our community. Thanks, Catherine. Appreciate that. And um, we'll ask Ashley to come to answer the question. Sure. So um, our housing advocacy is a huge focus area for MBEP's housing and climate change initiatives and our advocacy efforts specific to this process are designed to one, foster awareness on the importance of interdepartmental and interagency dialogue and collaboration to increase civic engagement, which could often involve pulling in and working um, with experts and partners to educate folks on the history and impacts of segregationist housing policies as Emmy um, did earlier. And three, to actually point folks to key resources, right? Such as HCD, AMBAG, EMB Action, our white papers, our farm worker housing action plan, our, um, you know, our transportation paper on integrated mobility, um, our climate funding opportunities page, which as a matter of fact, lists several programs that support fair and env environmentally sound housing. So there are several tools and resources out there that our elected officials and city staff and developers and employers and advocates just aren't aware of, um, don't have the bandwidth, don't have the time, you know, the constraints go on. And so in essence, that's our role, right? It's, it's to educate our, our region on climate smart development criteria, advocate for the right kinds of, of land use policies, and to collaborate with local leaders to bolster civic engagement. I'll stop there. I could go on. And yes, and we'll give you some more time to continue that thread. So thank you, Ash, for joining us today. Jen, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everyone. So I am with MidPen Housing. We're a nonprofit affordable housing developer, and we have been around for 50 years, but we've been working in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties for about 30 years. So we're pretty, pretty deep in both Santa Cruz and Monterey County. 
And we have a development team that's spread out over the 10 counties that we work in from Monterey to the south up to Napa and Sonoma to the north. And we have four development offices, one in Watsonville, Santa Rosa, Oakland, and Foster City. And so what that means is we've got a development team that's really embedded in all of the communities that we're working with. So the way we interact with the housing element update process is as community members. So we often participate in the housing element um, processes that are going on in the communities that we live in. So for myself, um, I'm participating in the city of Pacific Groves process. Um, we also participate as experts. So in, with our city partners, they might ask us for assistance in analyzing potential sites for their housing inventory to make sure that these are um, sites that are truly developable for the amount of, of units that they think they might be able to achieve on those sites. We might also advise on potential policies that they're looking at and bring some of the best practices that we've seen from other jurisdictions to bear. So those are, those are some of the different ways that we at, at Mid Penn Housing get involved. So kind of as individuals, as community members, um, and then also as, um, as experts in affordable housing. Thank you, Jan, and, and that's great. I think a lot of us in the housing space operate with different hats and stuff and to organize that and make it work uh, for you individually and as an organization, it's usually kind of challenging, but I appreciate the way you, you map that out for folks. Um, another question for everybody to jump into and, and I'll, I'll uh, call you out in a second, but uh, what do you hope specifically to see included in this sixth cycle of housing element updates? Um, and maybe if you've answered this question already, but anything extra that your organization plans on doing about it? And we'll start with uh, Jan. Um, well, the, the two things that come to mind for me is that the, that the housing inventories that cities are able to put together have um, more real development sites included in them. Um, and so, you know, that we've got a list of sites that really can be developed in the near term or in that housing element cycle. So that's one. The other is that um, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity zoning that um, is happening in San Jose and city of Berkeley, city of Sacramento. Um, so I, I'm just, and, and the city of Pacific Grove is, um, is also looking at that. And I'm, I'm really excited about that idea. And what opportunity zoning says is that you can build multifamily housing um, up to four units in any zone district, any zoning district. So basically it, it means there's no more single family exclusive zoning districts. And I, I just think that that's such an important policy. So I'm really hoping to see more cities um, considering that policy and adopting that um, in, the house, in this housing element cycle. Thank you. And a quick follow-up to you specifically on that is, um, you know, I think, I think of MidPen and I think high, higher density multifamily communities. Um, so the opportunity housing isn't that, right? You're, this is talking about right. more of the lower, okay. But, this is so talking about duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, yeah, that um, in smaller scale, right, that could be developed by individual property owners, could be developed by, you know, smaller developers, or, or even somebody like mid, mid Penn Housing working on a scattered site basis, but it's more about getting the housing built than it is about um, opportunities what, that for mid Penn Housing per se. Right. We yeah, need more housing right. of all types and lots of people to do it. Yeah, that's what I was hearing, but I want to make sure that was communicated. Appreciate that. Uh, same question for Ash. Right. So in addition to what Jan just mentioned, um, and like I mentioned earlier, our role in this process is to really advocate for compliant, feasible, and fair housing elements with climate change and environmental, em environmental justice in mind. And so... For me, like the top three, if I were to narrow it down, would be to include supporting growth in, in safe infill and dense locations, including zoning for more housing in low risk fire areas, um, ensuring you know, fair and inclusive zoning policies like Jan just mentioned. Because um, I mean, as we all know at the compounding crisis of climate change and housing affordability, just disproportionately impact you know low income and communities of color so in order to address our housing climate and equity issues we really need to change the stigma around multi-family home structures 
Um, and then lastly, to really encourage nature-based solutions for climate resilience and future developments. Um, you know, natural disasters don't discriminate. And so we need to build in a way that protects current and future communities um, and really encourage developers to be ambitious um, and then really ensure the community has an opportunity to provide input um, and just building again, more awareness and education around the fact that new uh, infill development has the opportunity to rejuvenate parts of a city that currently contribute negative, negatively to GHG emissions, urban heat islands, and, and pose fire and flood risk. So those Thanks. are like the top three inclusions. Thanks, Ash. We're gonna, we're gonna have to have a separate whole thing just to unpack all these awesome words and concepts that you're bringing up. But the one, one of the things that stood out to me and I'm probably other audience members that were impacted by the fires uh, last year, you know, the, the low risk fire access and building climate resiliency, I think really struck, should strike a chord with all of us, particularly Santa Cruz and Monterey counties that have lost hundreds of, of homes to, to fire. So we, we shouldn't obviously repeat the same patterns of the past or, or we'll, we're going to be in trouble again. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, next, want to hear uh, from Catherine. Oh, Catherine, you're on mute still. Sorry about that. Can, can you, there you go. Boy, Jan and Ash just, just really illustrate what they brought up are, are really excellent points. And it just illustrates what a difficult process the housing element is because you're trying to address a wide variety of physical, social, economic, scientific change um, in, in a policy document, which is, by its nature, political. And it's, it's hard. It is not an easy thing to do. I, um, you know, the, the opportunity zone that Jan was speaking about, that's something really exciting that's happening in planning. And we're, we've got our eyes on it. Um, the climate change and adaptation is huge and um, ways that we can address it by densification in uh, infill areas away from the wildfire hazard areas, that's really important. On the other hand, people come here because it's a beautiful place and they want to live in the trees where they have views. Those are the fire hazard areas. And, and much of our city is, is in those fire hazard areas. And so how we deal with that, I don't have the answer. So what I really want to see out of this housing element is I want to see community input that helps us come up with solutions. Because usually what we get is community input that is trying to stop change. And we need, we need to look at good change here. So, so that's what I want to see. I want to see good community input. And I want all of you guys to come to all of our community events. Thanks, Catherine. I think I think we we certainly plan on that and bringing some friends along. So we appreciate good. the in, invitation to figure out how we get to good change, as, as you put it. Um, and so uh, let me see. I think Sibley hasn't gone yet. Please. Yeah, I just want to thank Catherine for saying that. That warms my heart um, so much <laughs> because it's that hit the nail on the head. You know, it's the you know opposing change versus figuring out the best the best way we can to change in a positive direction. So I'll try to be specific, um, you know, yes on what was already said, the rolling back the exclusionary zoning with the opportunity zoning um, and, and to have the development site analysis be real. And I just, you know, put a finer point on it. The reality is uh, this process hasn't had accountability in the past. And this is the first time there's arena cycle throughout the state, the housing element cycle throughout the state of California, where there's real teeth in it that, that cities are penalized if it doesn't generate outcomes. And they have a lot of local control on how to get to how to figure out solutions, what those solutions should be. Um, but it actually has to work. And we have absolutely had a number of jurisdictions in our region that have intentionally, you know, put sites in their housing element and said, well, you could develop this many houses there. And 
it has never happened and it's never happened because it was never feasible in the first place to develop that many uh, units of housing in that location. And it was a way to just meet these numbers. So, you know, I'm just so excited that's over. And um, so the other thing I would add, you know, this, this, you know, the general upzoning of opportunity zoning is a great one, but I also think um, the higher density zoning opportunities exist. And, you know, looking region wide, the number one uh, generalized way to say it is is our downtowns. You know, our, our various downtowns are where it's least controversial to have more height and to expand, you know, the, the core of the downtown a bit. And it's a little different in every city. Um, you know, or even in the biggest intersections in some of the unincorporated areas, uh, like in Live Oak. So I'm I'm excited that there's been a lot of talk about that. And, you know, like the city of Santa Cruz has done that, you know, taking the in the last five years, taking the next section of downtown and upzoning it, and now is starting on the next section. But this housing element process will push that, nudge that along because the city, you know, that's a way for it to meet its need. And so we see that in Santa Cruz, but a lot of other cities, Watsonville's doing that and it's downtown right now and many others need to do it need to pick that up um, so i'm excited this will be a, a, a real push to get some of those plans that have started like in unincorporated santa cruz county uh the sustainable santa cruz plan that was passed in broad strokes you know about almost seven years ago but it's never been turned into zoning well now you know <laughs> let's get there so that's what i'm excited it's a lot of ideas we don't have to invent new stuff it's we got to push it over the finish line i think Thank you, Sibley. Yes, uh, uh, very good fodder for additional discussion. And you have a, a, a few good themes there, and maybe you can even take another minute or two to expand on anything you want to. Because this next question is just, you know, kind of maybe doing a little deeper dive on one one specific concept that you guys are are really tracking. Um, you know, one what is one specific challenge? that you've experienced maybe in the past with the last cycle as an example, and how would you want to specifically address that going into this uh, sixth, sixth cycle? Uh, we'll start with, with Ashley. Yeah, um, I think what Catherine said earlier, just, I mean, it really struck a chord. And so I really appreciate you, Catherine, for being super honest and just acknowledging and recognizing the fact that it is, super hard to have these conversations. It's a super complex process. Um, and if we're talking about process here um, and the, the you know, specific challenges, I think um, that I've personally experienced and in the role that I'm in at, at MBEP with prior um, housing element updates is that it would probably be the way in which planning departments communicate and deliver civic education and engagement opportunities to enable a truly inclusive process, which is exactly what you were referring to earlier. And so I appreciate the invitation, um, you know, and it really just kind of spans the gamut from like housing element update to fulfillment, right? And actual implementation. And so for me, through the lens of a housing and climate justice advocate, I think meeting our communities where they're at, making the public engagement process more easily available, accessible and easy to understand, um, you know, that's naturally just going to be an ongoing challenge. I think we'd all like to see addressed in this next cycle, but also just collaborating with advocacy groups like us early on, right, to be able to provide those high touch points that are sorely needed to address some of the, you know, the, maybe the nimbyism that goes on, for example, or just to get folks to learn about the process, the deadlines, understand the jargon, take the survey, attend the hearing, write a letter, etc. Um, just kind of goes back to the importance around collaboration and really keeping each other accountable especially if, if housing elements um, are really just meant to describe zoning policies and doesn't really actually mandate development, right? Um, and so there are some limitations in translating like arena number into actual homes. And that's a challenge in and of itself. Um, but if we design our elements thoughtfully and holistically with all the inclusions mentioned earlier, we can work around those limitations um, to ensure homes are actually built in line with RENAs. Um, so anyway, just really want to hone in on the importance of housing, climate, multimodal transportation and social justice advocates, you know, and activists can play a huge role in that challenge in this next cycle. Thank, thank you, Ash. Uh, Next, I uh, want to ask um, uh, Jan. Uh, 
the the thing that comes to mind for me is that um, Midpen has been able to develop 100% deeply affordable communities on sites in Santa Cruz County and other places where the the jurisdiction proactively rezoned sites using an affordable housing overlay zone. And that's an incredibly beneficial process because it basically creates a by right um, situation and that and it's done, you know, through the housing element process. The what what we would like to see um, one of the challenges with that approach is that it can create a windfall to the property owner um, because their their site is is zoned by right for a certain density. And so making sure that there's a balance between the opportunity that's created with deep affordability and community benefits is is what we want to see so that when when um, that that overlay zone tool is used that there's an eye towards really maximizing the affordability so it's both an opportunity and a really important tool and um and you know a, a challenge something that needs to be wrestled with during that um, housing element process thank you and uh, I'm going to hear from uh, Sibley. Well, I'm particularly really interested, even just in the arena targets that get developed, uh, meaning the you know amount of um, housing that um, is the goal for this next cycle, because. Uh, you know, we've been seeing across this and wrestling with where that goal gets distributed across the region. Um, so maybe it's a little different what you asked, but I, but I think it's something that advocates should pay attention to and that cities are going to get real engaged in. And um, we've seen, you know, because other regions happen first before our region in this process, we've seen that those goals are two to three times what they've been in the past, which I think is realistic because we've spent decades not building, not meeting the goal, you know, um, in general, uh, in California. Um, and so there's this accumulated definite deficit of millions of units of housing. And so these goals are through a more robust analysis of how much housing do we actually need at different income levels, the goals are coming out higher. And I think that'll happen in our region too. And then in the past, you know, it's been a very quiet part of the process of where, how much of these goals do you put in different jurisdictions? And, you know, there's been a tendency to put them more of the goal in jurisdictions where it's less likely to get built um, and, uh, you know, and, and other things just because of the pressures. And and so I'm just real interested in advocating um, for where the housing is most putting those goals and targets and then the zoning as we get further. Um, where the housing is most needed, uh, meaning generally, which means jobs and transportation, uh, where tribes and transportation is and infill locations, which addresses some of the you know, fire hazard issue. So, um, you know, th there's a whole multi-step process. And I think um, now for the first time, the housing element process, you know, a lot of people are paying attention. There's a lot of pressure to try to get that right and to, to make better outcomes um, through each of those steps of following these numbers and targets through. Um, and the, this is finally realizing what the housing element process was supposed to be when it started decades ago, which is that it, it eliminates the under, very understandable tragedy of the commons, which is, you know, we have 530 some jurisdictions in California, whatever. No one jurisdiction has the incentive to solve the housing crisis, right? In fact, you know, they, they, make a lot of pain for themselves if they start soaking up the housing demand of the area around them. And so the whole point of this process, well, then everybody's got to do their fair share and we got to try to make it intelligent across the regions. And it was just kind of a half-baked process until this time. And so it's going to be really interesting trying to get it right. Thank you for that. And, uh, and we want to hear from, from Catherine uh, and Catherine, I, uh, if you don't mind weaving into your your response, um, I think Jan brought up a good point too earlier that around uh, trying to have more uh, buy right opportunities as we update the housing element. So maybe as a local government um, and and a planner advanced in advanced planning, how does maybe define that for us a little bit and how does that weave into your work? Um, sure, and this is a process that's actually looks like it's being, it has been adopted in 
in some ways by the state. So it's, it's now mandated in certain circumstances. Um, and, and it looks like the state's gonna do more of that. Um, and what it means is that normally when you're going to do a development, you need some sort of an approval by the local government. Depending on the type of development, sometimes it's in, in a, a particular zoning district, a particular type of housing is allowed by right. You don't have to go through a planning process. You simply need a building permit. Um, and usually it's like in a single family zone, a single family home is allowed. And when you have multifamily home housing, it's normally not by right or previously was not normally by right. And we're moving towards uh, using the by right housing to encourage affordable housing by saying, if you build a development that is a minimum of 50% affordable housing to lower very low income households, then this housing is by right and you don't have to go through the planning process. Um, it's controversial, as you can imagine, a lot of people living in the community don't want that because that means they don't have any say in the development process. Um, but it looks like it may be the only way we get the amount of affordable housing that we need. And, you know, I have mixed feelings as a planner, I want to be able to say, oh, that's an ugly design. Let's, let's, you know, make it look better. And let's, uh, you know, meet this need that you have ignored and, you know, put in that. On the other hand, I want that affordable housing. And if this is what we need to do in order to get it, I'm for it. Thank you for that. Yeah, and this this process uh, would be easier if it wasn't for all this controversial. So thank you for, again, highlighting that it's come, come up uh, throughout. Is there anything else you want to add to your, your response to the previous question in terms of what you're looking, anything else you're specifically looking well, forward to? Yeah, I think I kind of covered it before. I want to get some really robust community input and I really want, I don't, I don't wanna hear, we want this. I wanna hear how you want it to happen. How, how, give us good ideas because just saying, you know, we don't, we don't want this in our neighborhood or we wanna see more of this, that's not good enough. You have to tell us how we can have that happen. The city itself is not building this housing. So how do we attract the developers who will be doing it? We work with MidPen. We've got several MidPen housing projects going on right now. And we really um, appreciate it when our affordable housing developers come in and help us. Thank you for that. And, and um, maybe we'll, if you don't mind, we're going to start pivoting to uh, questions in a few minutes. But before we get there, just a couple question, more questions of the panel here. Um, maybe you kind of teed up the the specific question we had for you. Could you rattle off uh, in a couple of minutes the, the the top just just a couple of minutes? I know there's a lot going on, but just the the big top line projects that you're super proud of that the city is is championing right now. Oh, wow. Um, I would not say the city is, is championing, championing the, any specific projects, although we do have some that we're actively involved in. Um, the Pacific Station North and Pacific Station South, um, both of those are, are city-involved projects. Um, the Coral Street project that Sibley's working on, uh, 350 Ocean Street is bringing us a lot of units and a lot of affordable units. Um, uh, the Jesse Street project that Mid Penn Housing is working on, uh, the the Calvary Church project. Um, it's it's still a, a bit amorphous, but it's going to be bringing us a lot of affordable housing. Also, then there's the Library Mixed Use project, which is also another city project, and that will be bringing us a, a number of affordable units. Um, Eight thirty one Water Street is has. They don't have an actual application in yet, but they've got a pre-app in and there's been a lot of discussion of that one. And then the Cedar Street project is another big one. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> well, that's good. So you're not just sitting on your hands. That's great. <laughs> not that anybody thought 
Not any, that anybody uh, accused you or anybody of that, but thank you for that. And and I, I, next question goes to Jan before we open it up some more. Um, Jan, I know. I mean, you get you've been at this affordable housing uh, work for decades now, and and I count you among my my many beloved uh, mentors here. We worked together several years back. Um, you know all these different battles to create a deeply affordable housing, what would you say are the top two or three kind of best practices uh, that, that, you, uh, that you've seen for, for housing elements that you wanna double down and expand on? Yeah, thanks for asking me that. I thought I was your only mentor though, not many mentors, but <laughs> okay. Um, well, so the one I wanna highlight, one of the ones I wanna highlight is the one behind me here. Um, so this is St. Stephen's Senior Housing that we built in partnership with the St. Stephen's Lutheran Church in Live Oak. And this is an example of where the, the new state laws wouldn't help us in streamlining this development, but an affordable housing overlay zone would, because this site was zoned public facilities before we worked with the county to rezone it. And we were able to build 40 um, affordable senior homes on, a, on some excess land that the church had. Um, so this is an example of the, the kind of thing that the, the housing element through their site inventory, through um, proactive af um, affordable housing overlay zones could create more opportunities to exactly as Catherine said, set the stage for developers to come in to be able to build affordable housing. The other one I wanted to just share really quick is um, that the, the, the county of Santa Cruz is really um, a model in terms of the, the, the first jurisdiction that really took the lead in proactively rezoning sites. And they did that to get a certified housing element. And this was one of the, the sites they rezoned. This is Shapiro Knowles out in um, the unincorporated county right next to the city of Watsonville. And they, back in the, the early 2000s, the county rezoned six or seven sites. And so far, I believe four of them have been developed. So that, was a, an action that the county took that zoned those sites by right for multifamily housing. They did all the environmental review and that set the stage for those um, properties to be developed. Mid Penn Housing now is working on one of the last of those rezoning sites on um, Atkinson Lane in the city of Watsonville. So it has created hundreds of affordable housing units through that really proactive and strategic work that the county did back you know, in the early 2000s. Thank you for drawing a straight line from all that the work at the public sector and how that that transcends over and relates to to actually getting the, the affordable housing done. Really appreciate that. Um, so we're going to uh, move to some audience uh, Q&A. We have a few in the the Q&A section here. We have one from Lee Holquist and he's asking for he says he's looking for information on well managed open space for people living in tents, vehicles, RVs, and other dwellings. That includes management and utilities, a place to be safely and securely housed. Can this be part of the housing element process? Um, anybody wanna take that on? Maybe this is for Catherine. Um, that is not typically a part of the housing element process, but um, I think that we all know that the non-housed population is a huge issue that needs to be addressed. And it's not as if people have been ignoring it. The state and local governments have been trying to work on this issue for a very long time, but it's, it's not an easy issue. And um, so far, it doesn't seem like we've come up with any uh, universal solutions. Um, yeah, as uh, to the yeah, suggest on, specific suggestion, um, I don't I don't actually know how that could be developed because um, you would have to have the land in the first place, and then um, you know one of the problems for cities is that we operate under a number of legal constraints, and and so um, we're able to do a lot during the pandemic with temporary housing sites but only because we could label them as temporary. It gets much more difficult when you're trying to develop something as permanent. So 
I agree that this is a, a, a real problem and we're looking for a solution. And that suggestion is, is something that I, I think might be a viable suggestion. It's, I don't see it as being an easy suggestion. Thank you. And Sidley, you were gonna help answer as well. Yeah, I just think there is there is a clear line that, um, you know, managed camp and spaces for that is a whole uh, project that uh, makes a lot of sense. There's been some great ones out there and it's something that should be pursued, but it's not part of the housing element because the housing element is about building permanent housing. Now there is homelessness related work in the housing element for sure, permanent supportive housing, um, changing hotels to housing through, you know, new state funding that's been going on for that very successfully in the last year. You know, so there's things about creating housing for folks who've been homeless that is can be a big part of a housing element, but not the um, places for people to sleep, you know, that are that are not permanent homes and shelter and stuff like that. Again, that is important work. It's just not housing element work. It's other work by the cities. Thank you. Um, so an another question is from uh, D Steiner. And um, how do you propose success for low income persons to be able to pay their rent? Is section eight available? Are there subsidies available? Uh, anybody I guess can jump in on this who's familiar with the funding landscape right now, particularly as it relates to Section 8 uh, rental assistance project base, I assume, or otherwise. Well, I'm sure Jan can jump in on this too. I mean, essentially, there's two ways that we're helping folks pay their rent in, in a big way. Yes, one is those housing choice vouchers and other types of voucher programs. Um, and Finally, there is some momentum uh, federally, nationally, for the idea of expanding that. There were some new vouchers in, in uh, some of the latest uh, bills, but um, and I was excited to at least see in Biden's presidential platform was you know making that a universal entitlement. We got a long ways to go to get there, but there's some hope. You know, we keep pushing. Maybe we'll get a lot more uh, vouchers for folks. Generally, those are not what you would call available. There's a long waiting list, thousands of people waiting for years to get those. Sometimes we can carve out a few more rapidly for folks who are chronically homeless or certain other categories. Veterans get, uh, you know, vouchers um, through a process, separate process, etc. But, you know, but there's a whole pool of vouchers out there. So one of the biggest challenges has been, how do you help people use those vouchers? It's been very difficult in our extremely tight housing market for anyone with a voucher to find a place to use it. There's thousands of households in Santa Cruz County that use vouchers today. But there's always hundreds, um, there's literally, you know, often close to 100 of folks who are homeless and have a voucher and are not using it yet. Other, you know, another 100 plus of folks who have vouchers um, and uh, are not using it yet, looking for housing. And then there's often several hundred in our county that um, have a voucher, are using it, but they're using it for a smaller unit. Like they're a family that could use a voucher for a three bedroom unit, but they're all in a one bedroom unit. Um, because they just haven't been able to find a three bedroom that, to accept their voucher. So it's certainly one of the goals of, of my work. And I know, you know, uh, MidPen and, and other nonprofit housing developers use uh, vouchers in certain ways. Project based vouchers is one way um, to say, you know, help fund the housing um, by helping folks with vouchers. That's great. But also affordable housing um, helps folks who don't have vouchers. So the more subsidized units we build with the um, kinds of subsidy that's out there um, and sometimes inclusionary housing that's built in market rate housing projects as well, uh, those create units where someone doesn't have to have a voucher, but they have to qualify as low or very low income. And then the rent is based on their income. So we need more of both of these things um, to be really you know, successful and to just have housing in general in our market be less expensive. So we need all those things. And that is a lot of what the housing element process you know, is meant to help uh, reduce barriers to, to creating more of. Thank you, thank you. So we have time for just a couple more questions. And there's one that came in earlier from uh, John D. Um, Gums, and she was specifically uh, responding to something Jan had mentioned about um, that, that housing and maybe higher density housing means less traffic with people not having to commute so far. And she would love to see case studies, examples, showing that this is the case. 
Are there any in Aptos, Aptos Village, Capitola, Soquel, Scotts Valley, elsewhere? So um, I think Ash might want to jump in on this too, but but Jan um, generated that that question. Is there a, a quick response to that, Jan, and then give Ash a minute as well? Yeah, well, I could say that um, the example that immediately comes to mind is a property that we opened two years ago in Watsonville called Pippin Orchards. And of the folks that lived there, that, that live there, 80% um, live or work in the city of Watsonville. And when you look at the, the places where folks work, they're all, you know, right in the city of Watsonville. And these are people that formerly had to commute in, many had to formerly commute in long distances to be able to get to their jobs. So that's one example that I can think of right off the top of my head of a most recent property. In, um, in Live Oak, Midpen's working on a site at 1500 Capitola Road. And there we actually worked with the county to create a, a neighborhood-based preference so that people who live or work in Live Oak will get a preference for the afford some of the affordable homes that we'll be building there. So that's another technique that we're using to be able to get people closer to their jobs when we build affordable housing so that we can really create those, um, those impacts that we wanna create, which is reducing traffic. Thank you. Ash, is there anything else you want to add to the response? Yeah, I mean, in addition to that, I think it's really just um, creating, you know, uh, more options, uh, more, you know, walkable, bike friendly, and, and really collaborating with our transit, um, you know, CCRTC, for example, and really um, looking at the funding opportunities available to really widen those opportunities. Um, and I do agree, we could use more, you know, case studies that actually look at um, uh, just, you know, the, the drop in GHG emissions, but also the drop in traffic reduction and, and things like that. We know that it exists in other places um, in the Bay Area, for example, but we could use more case studies, I think, in our region. Um, but we know for a fact that inclusionary, exclusionary zoning policies um, you know, force people to find homes that they can afford outside of the areas in which they work, which consequently drive up GHG emissions. And on the map, um, that website by the Census Bureau does an excellent job of showing the sort of inflow and outflow of commutes that take place. Um, so we can drop that in the chat too. But uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at some serious super commutes um, really all across our region, people who have to drive more than 90 minutes to get to work. Um, and, and we're already you know, seeing examples right here in Santa Cruz um, that can significantly reduce that just by creating more um, transit oriented infill you know, smart development. Perfect, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing more information about that. So we'll, we're about to wrap up with one final question from Rafa Sonnenfeld, uh, this should be a quick answer, I think, but what are the consequences to cities if they don't produce a housing element that the state certifies as compliant, or if they don't achieve the development goals for producing low income housing that the arena requires? Uh, Sibley or Catherine, do you guys have a quick answer to that? Um. The, the consequences have changed over the last five years or so, but the biggest consequence for the city or, or the, the longest term consequence for the city is that um, if we do not have a certified housing element, we are not available for a lot of state funding. So in a way that's kind of a self-defeating because that state funding is often what helps us build the affordable housing. Um, so it's really important to have that. Now with, with new legislation that's passed, um, there are uh, more severe consequences. I, I'm not actually sure, let's see, not having a certified, if not meeting arena numbers um, has, has, has new consequences. I don't think that there are any more new consequences for not having a certified housing element. Thank you for your response. Sibley, you want to add anything in 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah. And, and 
I, I want to say, first of all, we'll get into all these wonky details. And I just really want to say to everybody, I mean, first of all, thanks for showing up and listening in on this. And I want to say that I think this is the biggest opportunity to advocate for more housing across the region, you know, not just one little neighborhood or something, but really to make some systemic change across our region in the Monterey Bay region. Like this is the thing. And it's going to be a couple of years. It's going to take a couple of years process, you know, a little bit this year, more next year and finish up after that you know this is going to be a long process but if we do this together we this is how we really start turning the ship i think so i just want to end with stressing that importance and yeah i mean i mean hopeful i would love it if no the, none of these consequences ever happen to a city because we all start building the housing right um but but uh, in broad strokes if the cities and unincorporated counties now are not meeting their arena goals in terms of actually um permitting, uh, you know, attracting uh, housing to be applied for and then approving it, then um, there's all these various ways that um, housing, then they have less control of the housing that's been built. And that's generally very important to cities and citizens and to city councils. So more projects can go to the state for approval instead of to the local um, government. And um, they can't, you know, change zoning in certain ways uh, if they're not meeting these arena requirements uh, in the future. So then they, they don't have as much land use control and they are forced to really approve projects. You know, if projects have affordable housing in them and meet the objective standards in the zoning, um, cities can't say no if they're not meeting all these arena numbers. So, so you know, that's, uh, while it sounds uh, technical or how bad is that, you know, um, it actually really matters a lot um, to city governments uh, and to elected officials that if you know they don't have a they can't control land use in their own city um, and so there's a lot of drive to like find their own way to meet these goals um, to maintain that control thank you so the discussion continues really appreciate this engaging panel and all your expertise and commitment to getting this right and uh trying to create the good change as was mentioned earlier. So we appreciate everybody for joining us today. Thank you for the audience. And we have up here uh, very simple ways to get involved and stay engaged. And we'll continue reaching out to folks as, as we move through this process in the next few months. Um, let us know how, how you're doing as well. And again, just wanna thank the sponsors, our panelists, our event organizers, especially Emily Ham. Uh, who presented our crash course and quarterback this event. Uh, we wish everybody a happy Friday and relaxing weekend. See you all soon. Take care. <laughs>